Hey, what's up, Los Angeles? Welcome back to the Ram Skinny here on the LAFB Network. We are Los Angeles Sports. Apologize for a, a little brief hiatus. We didn't get to our preview episode of the Ram Seahawks game. I was doing some traveling. I was up in the Pacific Northwest, beautiful place. Unfortunately, didn't get to make the Ram Seahawks game, but I was up there. And then with traveling, it just didn't work for us to record. But we're back to talk uh, about that thrilling overtime win, 26 to 20. And as of this recording, the trade deadline just passed. The Rams did make one move, whether it was good or bad. We'll talk about that and kind of what it means setting up for the rest of the season. So kind of a combo uh, talk about the game, but also look at the trade deadline and, and look forward as the Rams uh, move on and, and look much better placed to make a run at the playoffs. But first and foremost, Mr. Skinny T running the show. What's up, man? How we doing? I'm doing good. You know, so much news and, and fast and furiousness happening in the morning up until one o'clock Pacific time. And now we got the rest of the day. There's nothing going on on November 5th, 2024. That is news or or, no, or noteworthy. So yeah, we just yeah. get to enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah. Just another uh, Tuesday just another in November. Just another yeah. day. Um, now with that being said, uh, I'm going to try to get this episode up before the day's over. So everyone make sure to go out and vote. Uh, I, absolutely hate politics however i am always honored to vote it's a it's a right as a u.s citizen and i think there's a lot of power in it and for me i honestly i don't want to say care less but i'm not even really caring about the presidential election but there's a lot of local stuff that actually really affects us i know there's a lot of education stuff on the ballot for right here in you know my pasadena and la county now that i have a kid in school so for those of you that hate politics like me and i'm sure you do too skinny but uh and definitely don't enjoy these presidential um candidates we'll just leave it at that but there is a lot of local stuff that is worth actual voicing and voting for that you could uh it could actually affect your everyday life so make sure go out and vote it's really easy here in california Easier than the DMV, I think. Uh, easier than just about everything, I think, to vote. So uh, make that happen. Make your voice heard. Um, but did you want to, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on that. Yeah, yeah. Two two quick things on that. So the last election, uh, the, the, the voter turnout was 66%. And so when you break that down, it's about a third of the people that are making decisions about, uh, and this, is, this isn't just about the last election or who, who or who was not elected uh, in that, um, but uh, let's get that percentage up. Um, you know, if, you, if, if you're frustrated with anything um, in the country or locally, go vote. Uh, you can make your voice heard and it, it, it does matter, even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Um, and one of the things I'm really excited about about being beyond this among all, a, a lot of other things is those political commercials during football games. Ugh. I find so, so maddening, uh, you know, from both sides, you know, I'm not trying to get partisan either way, but just like having to be subjected to some pretty insane, insane commercials. I was watching a, a, a Nebraska local feed of the U, UCLA Nebraska game. <laughs> Politics are much different in my home state of Nebraska. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> oh yeah i mean politics in general are i always and this will be the last time we talk politics but i think back to like my so the first election i voted in was 2008 john mccain against barack obama and it just like obviously there's still like some nastiness even back then but much more respectful and tasteful back then than where we're at now in this and and it's just yeah crazy so that's why i say like i i care more about this local stuff that actually like can affect my everyday life because i mean I think we've seen over the last three months that there actually is a president, an acting president, and we haven't heard about him in three months. So uh, I think there's more power in the local stuff than uh, who is the figurehead up top. But anyway, neither here nor there. Get out and vote. Get, make your voice heard. Um, NFL trade deadline passes. But first, let's talk about this 26 to 20 thrilling victory. It was a very up and down roller coaster game um, for the Rams and this game and this podcast as always brought to you by Bet Online. Head to betonline.ag today. You can vote on the election if you want. Still a few hours to get that in. Uh, but I prefer to stick to voting to football or uh, betting on football. Uh, all that can be done at betonline.ag where the game starts. As always, I put you on the spot, Skinny. Just give me your overall uh, take on this game. I mean, like I said, it was a roller coaster. There were some moments where the Rams looked dominant. And then especially at the end of that first half when things got flipped on its head and, you know, a 13 point swing or whatever it was. Uh, and things looked pretty bleak and and grim. What was your overall um, perspective of this win? 
Yeah, this I think was a really good litmus test. I think these two teams were really evenly matched. Um, I know, you know, some projections were kind of splitting it right down the middle. I think that the the Rams went in as underdogs. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, but I think this these these two teams are are actually quite good tests for one another. And and that's what led to the the thrilling outcome. You know, you got Seattle's terrible offensive line. Uh, going up against this uh, defensive pass rush that's really coming into its own. And that was a perfect storm that created all sorts of havoc. Um, You know, you're looking at PFF here. We got 29 created pressures. Jared Verse and Kobe Turner leading the way with seven apiece. Braden Fisk with five. You got to love, you got to love that. But you know, they're, they're going up against the Seattle Seahawks third string uh, left tackle. I think it was or right tackle. One of the two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what you got to do when you, when you go up against a bad unit, you got to dominate. So that's, that's really encouraging to see, Um, you know, the passing game, you know, at times looked like it's old self. And and when you got an old man at uh quarterback, uh, he just wants to get home. He doesn't want to stick around for, for a long overtime. So he just ended it, you know, a couple of plays and hit Demarcus Robinson and Demarcus Robinson. This is, this is amazing. That's incredible. <laughs> what a game for that guy. Yeah. Um, so those, those are my positive takeaways. Uh, I got plenty of plenty on the negative side for all of those uh, people that like the, the fair and balancedness of our <laughs> approach to this. Uh, I, we'll, we'll hit that. But, you know, I think uh, you got to chalk up a win as a win. Uh, back to four and four. Well yeah. within the playoff hunt. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of, you know, what we were thinking of, of, of this season, it's starting, it's starting to materialize. This is looking like a 10 win team again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think well said there. And, you know, Matthew Stafford, I, I didn't even realize this going into the game, but he is now five and O against the Seahawks as a member of the Rams, obviously hasn't played in every game that he's been here because of injury. Um, but in the ones he has, he hasn't lost to the Seahawks team. So five and O, you know, the 12th man, the, the Hawks nest, whatever you call it up there at Lumen Field, that's a tough place to play. So regardless of, of the up and ups and downs, which we'll get to and some of the negatives, I mean, a big, big road win against a divisional opponent that now you take a, a, a lead in over the division. So hats off, you know, finishing. I think that's what we've we've talked about, how they can finish games. You know, we've talked about that about other L.A. teams, specifically the U.S. Trojans, who also were in the Pacific Northwest and were unable to finish just across the way against the Washington Huskies. Um, that's a different conversation. Rams were able to finish uh, in overtime. Um, got maybe a little bit of, I don't want to say luck, you know, interesting for Seattle to go for it on fourth, but the Rams would have still got the ball back and they scored a touchdown, so it didn't really matter. Um, but would that have swung momentum in any different ways if they would have just kicked the field goal and taken the three? But but yeah, I, I think this team is showing signs of, like you said, what we saw. The offense is still a bit up and down, you know, they won 26 20, but one of those was a 103 yard uh, interception return for a touchdown by Cameron Kinchins, the rookie. Uh, two interceptions for the rookie, which is great to see. Um, but, you know, so, so really only 20 points from this offense, um, which, you know, I think Seattle, with their injuries and with this new instilled defense with Mike McDonald. I mean, it's a good defensive unit overall. I don't have in front of me their, their overall statistics. You might know better than me, um, but it's, it's a, it's a good defense, a much improved defense. And so 20 points is not like something to just like slouch about, but you know, I think the offense just showed some, some ups and downs, little bit of seeing Stafford go back to that uh, targeting Cooper cup on everything, but at least he did find, like you said, Demarcus Robinson in, in critical moments, two touchdowns for D Rob, obviously the one in overtime, he ended up with six total receptions, but you had cup with 11 D Rob with six Tyler Johnson with three and no one else had more than one. Now there were five other players with at least one catch. Um, so did spread the ball around in terms of the amount of players touching it, but it was a very heavy Cooper cup, which, Hey, He's one of the best receivers in football, so when he's healthy, can't fault him on that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, because you kind of touched on it already on defense, but pretty weak ejection for Puka Nakua. Uh, got thrown out at the end of the first half there for a thrown punch. Was it a punch? Was it more of a, a slight <laughs> shove towards the head? You know, I think Rams fans would say a shove. I think Seahawks fans would say a shove or a punch. I say I don't think that was worthy of an ejection. I get it. 
a punch is a if you if you deem it as a punch, it's an automatic ejection. But anyway, luckily it didn't cost the Rams. They were able to get the the win. But um, yeah, I mean they made it out uh healthy, right? I think that's almost the yeah. the win is the most important thing. The second most important thing, well. Actually not, because Rob Havenstein did go down another injury. Is there an update on that, actually? I know you wrote about it. Oh, um, yeah, there has been. Um, also, Josh Wallace, who had been yeah, starting at uh, Nickel Corner, also uh, went down as well. Um, I cannot remember. I'll keep thinking on the Havenstein thing. It'll it'll come back to me at some point exactly what uh, was said. But, um, you know... Uh, you know the 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 Havenstein the Havenstein thing was that uh, he's not going on the IR. That's the big news, and there's um, a chance that he's going he's going to miss. Here it is. It's all coming back to me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's going he's going to miss uh, the Dolphins game. Uh, likely to miss. Uh, probably will. Doubtful. He he's probably won't play. Um. So. You know, uh, not nothing long term. So that that's 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 the good news there. We will eventually see the intended starting five at some point. Maybe <laughs> in the season. Probably, maybe yeah, maybe maybe not. You don't count your ch- chickens before they hatch. But uh, yeah, the Josh Wallace one is actually a, a bit more concerning. And the big news in the trade deadline is they moved on from from Tra- Tre'Davious White, which was expected. It, was, mm-hmm. it wasn't nothing uh, surprising there. He's been a he's been a uh, healthy scratch for the last four weeks since Darius Williams came back. Uh, there's some s- strangeness there, but he's gone, uh, which reveals some some serious depth. And you know, getting getting to the negative side of things, um, they let up some incredible um, explosive passes. This defense did. Uh, mm-hmm. We saw several of them going to Jackson Smith and Jigba, but you know, several several big chunk gains of of twenty or more yards. Um, and the secondary is just not able to cap that. Um, and, you know, we were talking about it offline. They're headed to play Dolphins on Monday Night Football where they've got guys like Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell and Devon A-Chain who are explosive pass or explosive uh, play creators. Um, so that's, I mean, that's my big negative takeaway is, you know, the, the depth at the secondary now is at a place where they are relying heavily on the 31-year-old Darius Williams. They're relying on Akella Witherspoon has definitely lost a step, uh, who isn't great against explosive pa- passes. And then that question at what you want to do at, at nickel corner now with Josh Wallace, who's carted off the field, no updates on him yet. Um, you know, th- those are the only guys you got. Behind him, you got Cam Lampkin and Sean Jolly on the practice squad, and you have also uh, undrafted rookie um, uh, Charles Woods uh, mm-hmm. there as well, and that's your cornerbacks right there. Um, and you know the, the pass rush has been awesome, but you saw Geno Smith be able to carve it up a little bit, and that's that's going going forward a week, which we'll get into more. Uh, to to Tunga Vailoa is great at at punishing. Um, uh, blitzers and, and, and tough and tough pass rushes. So, um, that's, that's, it's, it's a big, it's a big question going forward. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's worth mentioning cause I don't, I don't want to turn a, a positive into a negative, but it's just, when you look at sustainability of the turnovers, it's not, you know, you play to get turnovers. Those are game changing plays. And those are why this defense I think has, you know, held up really well um, in terms of the scoreboard is they've been extremely opportunistic in the turnover category. I mean, Geno Smith, three interceptions uh, in this one. And, and the Ram, obviously one of those returned uh, pick six uh, in, in the Raiders game, lots of turnovers. Um, and so they've, they've done really well in that. And it reminds me not to bring it back to USC, but obviously both these teams play in LA. We cover both. It reminds me of the 2022 USC team because that defense under Alex Grinch was not a good defense. Um, but they were phenomenal in the turnover category. And so it, it, it hit a lot of those deficiencies that year where those kind of came out in the PAC 12 championship game and in the cotton bowl against Tulane, because they didn't have those turnovers, but early on in the season against Oregon state, some of these other Notre Dame, these other games that they were able to pull away from. And you look like, Oh, three interceptions. Oh, two fumble recoveries. This, those are, I'm not saying those are just flukes, but you really can't rely on those as your, 
kind of defensive mantra because there's some points when the turnovers just kind of dry up a little bit. Like, yes, you can do things in terms of scheme, in terms of, um, you know, different blitz packages and pressure rates and, and different disguises to obviously inflict more pressure to elicit turnovers. But depending on the quarterbacks you're playing and depending on the running backs you're playing, like they're just not going to happen as frequently. And so those I think have masked some of the deficiencies because as you mentioned, the, the big gash plays, I mean, the, the Seahawks outgained the Rams over 420 total yards. Gino had what 360 yards passing uh, or whatever it was. So um, again, not trying to turn a negative or positive into a negative, but those are just things that, you know, you can't rely on getting three to four turnovers a game um, and still winning in overtime. Uh, if you're getting three to four turnovers a game, you should probably be winning by three touchdowns. And then it's like, okay, well, yeah, you can't rely on the turnovers, but they turned all those into touchdowns and they won by three touchdowns. But like you needed those three just to get into overtime and win in overtime. Um, that's where you, some of those things need to be cleaned up against, you know, I don't want to say better teams because like I think the Seahawks are very evenly matched. They're a playoff contender. It was a road game. Um, and so, so all good. I'm not saying those are bad, but those are, you know, don't be surprised if those turnovers dry up and things get exposed a little bit more. That's all. Yeah, and I I think speaking to the the secondary even more is I don't th- I don't feel like a lot of those turnovers were created by stealthy play in the secondary. You know the 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 one in the red zone, uh, Braden Fisk was the one that caused uh, the uh, Geno Smith's pass to lose power and 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 basically drop it in the bucket for that for that uh, 103 yard return. Which I mean that's incredible as well. I just could not believe that. Yeah, <laughs> longest of the year like so that. far. The long, longest, I think, in Rams history as well. I think you're right, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you look at those three turnovers, you look at a lot of mistakes. Uh, they lost, uh, the Seattle Seahawks lost 44 yards on uh, missed snaps that just flew past uh, Geno Smith. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the 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 Seahawks were trying to give this game away a, a lot of times. And, and you know, to, to hop over onto the offensive side of the thing, side of things uh not not one of the best stafford games obviously has the heroics at the at the last part um but you know it's it's starting to look like he needs everything to be in place everything needs to be just right um for him to look phenomenal um you know and 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 not everything was was just right in this one you got puka nakua going out early on a, a very silly call uh he you know, keep your hands to yourself, uh, I think is, is the yeah. takeaway there. Uh, <laughs> then you won't have that problem. Um, uh, and then you look at the, the Seattle Seahawks pass rush was, was really kind of exposed our, our guy Dietrich there, uh, for allowed, uh, uh, pressures there. No, no, no sacks coming away from the game. So that's, that's great. But, you know, Stafford's mobility is, is, is also kind of concerning, uh, going down the stretch when they face some of these teams with uh, stouter pass rushes, he's 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 been one of the most hit quarterbacks. Now he's a big dude that can shake off defenders, um, but he has zero scrambles this year. <laughs> so yeah. he's, he, I mean, he's never he's never been that that real mobile guy. But it's really, it, you know, it, his his arm isn't uh, it hasn't gone away. His ability to, uh, you know duck a defender here or there hasn't gone any way, but you know, the, the scramble ability has, has gone down to zero. Yeah. Statue, if you will. Yeah. Happy so, feet statue. He's like a, you know, he's a little more mobile than Peyton Manning was at the end of his career. I think we'll yeah. give him that. We'll give him that benefit of the doubt. Had that, had that, uh, beautiful evade from Minnesota on Thursday night a while back. So that was and another one against Seattle too. Yeah. Another one against Seattle. So, you know, he can still do that, but, um, yeah, and you know the run game wasn't able to totally get going, you know, with with only I think three point one yards for carry for Kyron on twenty two carries, yeah. but you know at least they stuck with it twenty two carries. They almost got to that twenty five thirty threshold, which I always pound the table for. So so that's decent to see at least. And and like I said, it was good to see Demarcus Robinson, you know, step up in in Puka's absence and and you know really some clutch clutch plays there down the stretch, especially. Um, in the end zone twice. So my wife has him on her fantasy team in the last two weeks has really helped her out. Okay. Um, doesn't, she has no idea who it is, but I told her to start him and it's worked out, I guess for, her. um, but speaking of the trade deadline, you mentioned it, Tredavious white traded to Baltimore for a 2026 seventh. I was thinking it's so funny. It's like two or three years down the line at that late of a pick. So basically paid him 3 million bucks to play four games 
man, I wish I could get that kind of paycheck. <laughs> How nice would that be? I would $3 million dollars to play four games. And not yeah. well, by the way. Give up, what, four touchdowns? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the joke I may always make about, uh, you know, making money is I, I can't guarantee that I'm not going to be a problem in this world. Um, but if, if you want me to, if you want me to not be a problem, just give me a couple million dollars and I'll, I'll go away. Yeah. <laughs> I can't yeah. promise anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sounds great to me. So, um, so yeah, traded that. So that, that brings us up to this. I mean, kind of roll with this till we end the show is the depth of this team. So don't trade for anyone. You know, there was, there was thoughts of maybe, you know, obviously two weeks ago was like, oh man, is Cooper cup going to be gone? Is Matthew Stafford going to be gone? Um, obviously when they beat Minnesota, that was unlikely. And then for sure when they beat Seattle, it was like, okay, they're definitely not selling. Um, but would they go buy it? Would they be buyers? Would they go get another big name, whether it's receiver O-line or corner, you know, Marshawn Lattimore was on the block and he ends up going to the commanders for a pretty hefty price. What was it? A third and a fourth. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what they traded for Von Miller in the Super Bowl years. I think they gave a second and a third actually for Vaughn, but um, so pretty high price, but you know, Lattimore goes out there. There was a few other potential corners on the block. Uh, some other maybe receivers just add depth and end up holding Pat. So before I kind of get into my, my thing, I get that this team now is one, two in a row. I get that they're getting healthier, but do you think it was a mistake to not go get someone not even a star necessarily, but at least a depth piece. Do you think they should have gone and traded for someone or you're happy with them kind of just staying pat? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of, of positions that you definitely have to look at that they sh probably should add. We've already touched on it. Cornerback, you know, you've got Darius Williams, you've got Co Kobe Durant, um, and you've got Quentin Lake who can play some nickel, um, you know, the Kella Witherspoon and Charles Woods. Cam Lampkin, Sean Jolly, like I'm yeah. not inspired by this group. Um, and I like I like the pass rush, and obviously they can they can affect the game. But when that when that isn't hitting like that, when you're not going up against uh, the maybe the the worst offensive line in in football, um, what is that what is that going to look like for the secondary? And when you go up against a quarterback that's a bit more mobile than than Geno Smith, he can create a little bit more time for himself. What is that going to look like um, come playoff time? Because you know, defense wins championships and they're, they're going to be facing off against teams like, you know, the, the Eagles and the Lions and, and if they are able to make the playoffs. And so that's going to be a huge question going down the stretch there. Um, another yeah. one that I'm uh, that I'm thinking right now is running back as well. Um, you know, Blake Corm has played here and there. Uh, if Kyron Williams were to go down with an injury, is he ready to step into that position? A lot of speculation there, you know, that counts on a lot. But another one is tight end, and that this might be the, the my new hobby horse, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Colby Parkinson is not working out as a as a viable Tyler Higby fill in, and Higby hasn't looked great over the last couple of years. He's been fine. He's been, you know, I would say good enough. Is he going to look better coming off of a MCL and ACL tear? In um, and you know, Seattle did a fantastic job basing the tight ends completely out of this, out of this game anyway. So, you know, it's, uh, that's another question that I would say is, you know, it was, was that, is that a missed opportunity, um, to kind of pad that, uh, either with, you know, you know, a name like David and Joku was floated, floated out there, uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't hear a lot of the talk about uh, tight ends moving. I don't think any of them ended up moving. Um, but you know that that's definitely definitely another uh, question. And and I would say this was your last time to try to get something out of Tutu Atwell in the form of a of a late yeah. round pick to send yeah. send send him off to a team where they know what to do with him because it's quite obvious that either he doesn't know what he's doing in the McVay offense or or McVay doesn't know what. Uh, to do with Tutu Atwell in, in the offense, yeah. Um, so that, that that experiment is over. We've we've been over it, and uh, that was their last <laughs> chance. And and maybe they were shopping him. Uh, yeah. and maybe everybody was like five eight. Yeah, no, that, we're, we're good. <laughs> we're good. You got Skinny T's number on the line. Like we can have him yeah. coming for a tryout. Why not? Um, yeah, I'll work backwards. Yeah, I'll work backwards to forwards forwards to backwards. I don't know. I'll start with tight end because I agree. This was a I think a potential opportunity. There's not like 
you know, there's not seven Travis. I know he's having a down year, but there's not like a, a tree of Travis Kelsey's out there and the Rams would just don't have one of them. Like there's, there's legitimately like maybe five elite tight ends in the game today, but there are other pass catching tight ends out there that can play a role. Like they, they didn't, I don't think they needed to trade for a three down tight end, but if you have a guy that can maybe in third down or red zone situations, give you an opportunity, it was worth it. One name we kind of, we kind of talked about and you, there's a huge injury risk factor because he literally has not been able to stay healthy since being drafted. But Greg Dulcich with the Broncos has now been healthy and been a healthy scratch by the Broncos, uh, the tight end out of UCLA. And we know his, his skill set is as a pass catcher. So if, if Colby Parkinson is seen as a, a traditional run blocking pass blocking tight end, Dulcich is kind of your more like X, Y, Z receiving tight end type. Um, that can chip and, and help here and there, but he's not like a known for his blocking. But if he can come in on 10 snaps a game in red zone or third down opportunity and stretch the field for you, they could have probably gotten him for, for real cheap and, um, and potentially added him. So again, injury risk is a factor, but if we know the Rams, we know they like trading for injury prone players. So why not? Like, they're going to draft or sign or trade for injury guys that have had injuries and hopefully get, get them on the cheap because of that. So, so that was one opportunity I think they could have added there. Um, I don't need to add more to what you said about the secondary. I mean, that's obvious. The depth there is definitely a concern down the stretch. I think what, uh, I don't know what adjective or descriptive word I want to use, but when looking at this team and this roster, again, we're on the same page. They're trending up. They're looking like the team we thought they were going to be. They're now four and four. They have everything in front of them. Absolutely. Right now. I think they, they right now, with everything that's coming back, can be a playoff team. Should be a playoff team, especially with how the division's shaking down. The only thing that I like, I'm like, I think they left on the table on this trade deadline is that they're kind of now banking on everyone that's been hurt to come back fully healthy and remain fully healthy. And that is like, to me, a big risk when just last week, Puka Nakua comes back and then guess what? Leaves practice with a apparent knee injury. Now he ended up being okay. Um, but that's just a foreshadow of like the dude played one game and then left practice with an injury again. Like who's to say Steve Avila or, or Jonah Jackson come back, play a game and then get hurt again. And then you're like in the same boat. Who's to say the tight end ever gets tight end position ever gets more formalized or who's to say you don't lose another big star, whether it's Cooper cup, I need to be just knocking on wood everywhere. Karen Williams, <laughs> Matthew Stad, whatever. Um, and so I think there was opportunity to, if you're not going to go after a premier guy, if you're not going to go after a Marshawn Lattimore, because you don't want to give up that much in the secondary, not going to go after a David and Joku. I think Cleveland ended up being pretty steadfast that they were not going to move him, but had they been, it would have cost a, a pretty penny. I think you could have at least gone after some like good, valuable depth pieces just in case in six weeks, because they had an early buy. I mean, they got a lot of football still ahead and a lot of opportunity, unfortunately, for guys to go down. And we don't want to, you know, you never want to plan for injuries, but you also don't want to just pretend they're not going to happen because then if they do, and this team, let's say is at six and four, seven and five, eight and five, and all of a sudden you lose someone and you lose the season because you have no depth. That's where it's like, man, they could have maybe solved that by adding a piece or two at this deadline. Yeah. And, and just to speak to like kind of injury pro prone players, Darius Williams had missed four games to start the season. Uh, again, going to the, to the, the cornerback room. Um, Josh Wallace, as I said, said is now out. We don't, we don't know what's up with him. Akella Witherspoon last year was dealing with a knee injury all year. There's a reason he wasn't signed in free agency back in March. There's a reason he was still available just uh, last month. Uh, there's a reason that he wasn't on the field when he had initially been signed. Um, so, I mean, that's just that group, which is yeah. just, just terrifying. Then you go down, Alaric Jackson started the season with an injury. Um, yeah, Rob Havenstein injury prone now Matthew Stafford always one hit away as tough as he is Kyron Williams always been thought of as an injury risk Puka Nakua Cooper Cup uh both now looking uh, I mean Cup especially looking feeble what you know I I'm not ready to call him cooked but uh he, he's not uh he's not the player he once was a few years ago I, I'm comfortable saying that um it, 
and and the big questions the big question is is how are the ram how is the rams front office viewing this year um is it kind of like what they were thinking last year where they were is are we just gonna run this year through and see see how much good vibes we can uh create throughout and 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 how much we can celebrate uh pat ourselves on the back for drafting a couple of good defensive linemen over the last couple of years um or are they are they all in trying to maximize what's left of of matthew stafford you know is yeah. he got is he got two more years in him for when this team fully comes together and as we've discussed several times, there's no there's no plan. There's no there's no heir apparent to the quarterback position for the Rams. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get too far out and too or too doom and gloom just because all that's uh, unpredictable. But what is what does this year mean to this to this team? Are they thinking, hey, if we just get our foot in the door, we got a four game stretch in the playoffs where we can see ourselves back back in the Super Bowl? I mean, is that what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I what did um what did Cam Robinson go for from the Jags to Ooh. the Vikings? Do you remember what his trade value package was? Just what was it two days ago? <laughs> was it just two days ago? It seems like an eternity ago. Um, let's see. I, if I, I don't can... recall. Well, here you maybe look for it while I'm talking. Um, but I don't remember what did the but I'm bringing that up because the Rams went all in on offense. This they basically, without saying it, did a rebuild on defense and say we're just going to go young and as long as we can play competitive, get after the quarterback and and stay in games, the offense is what's going to win it for us. They went all in. They have one of the highest expensive offenses in all of football. The most expensive offense. The most. Thank you. The most expensive. So knowing that, and with that being the kind of philosophy of what this 2024 iteration of the Rams is, seeing all of the injuries, but knowing that that is what is required to win and get to the Super Bowl, you don't ever not then remain all in on the offense. And so to me, then they should have gone all in at the trade deadline and said, okay, let's assess where we're at. And, you know, obviously Avila and Jackson are going to come back on the offensive line, but again, who knows how healthy they will remain. Like if it's me, I'm going after another offensive lineman adding to that. Um, Maybe another receiver because if Cup and McCoop and Nakua do not remain healthy, we know how that offense completely falls off. Um, and so I'm not necessarily throwing names. And I brought up Cam Robinson, and obviously the Vikings absolutely needed him because Christian Derrissaw goes down there starting left tackle. But now the Rams are without Rob Havenstein for potentially another week, two, three, who knows for sure. So they're without a tackle and starting Warren McClendon on that side. So, um, you, to me, if that's the, the group you're all in on, you can't just keep playing musical chairs and hoping it can get you to where you want to go. If if your mindset was all in on the offense, you've got to remain all in on the offense and not just hope everyone gets healthy at the right time. If that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars got a 2026 conditional fifth round pick for Cam Robinson and a conditional 2026 conditional seventh round pick so basically a pick swap for him so it's like why not i i would have done that yeah yeah it's uh, as we're i will say as we're recording your favorite player joe nopum just came off the ir so nopum may be available against the dolphins which i would assume he'll start probably at actual right tackle, right? Maybe the, the most recent uh, press conference, McVay said he's they're not sure whether they'll go Havenstein or McClendon, and it I think it kind of depends on who who's available to play the left guard position because uh, Noteboom has played there in the past. Yeah, he's played just about everything but center. He has played everything but center, but has a bit more ex- experience at left guard, and that's that's actually where I like him the best is as a guard. Um, yeah, but, I think we both agree. I mean, he's also been bad at that position as well. He's, he's, he's been, he's been okay at several positions and bad at all of them as well. So <laughs> I don't, I don't love it. Um, you know, luckily Miami's pass rush isn't, isn't, uh, firing on all cylinders right now. So it won't be as much of an issue, but, um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when, you know, going back to, uh, less needs 
thought process is always, he's always thinking in bets, right? Yeah. Uh, and he's betting a lot, everything on the health of Puka Nakua and Cooper cup, essentially. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if, and I, I said this last year and it's always going to come back to haunt me. Are, are they just a, are they just a Kyron Williams away from this offense turning everything around? Apparently that was true last year. Are this year, are they just a couple of linemen away from, um, Matthew Stafford, Matthew Stafford looked so bad when he was just throwing to Tyler Johnson and Demarcus Robinson. And he had a, and he had a tough time when it was just cup in the lineup as well. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, we're, they're, we're in a weird spot, even though things are trending really well and the vibes are, are really good there. You know, there are a couple of injuries away from this thing, like again, falling all apart and, and injuries, as you've been saying, they don't, they don't just have this trajectory where everything just keeps getting better as, as the days move on. And as people get healthy, people get hurt. Uh, um, but we're not betting on that and, you know, back to four and four. So yeah. get my head out of the gutter yeah. well, and, and on the positive <laughs> side, the like, this offensive line did give up zero sacks against the Seahawks, uh, 18 pressures. So uh, a lot of pressures there, but no actual sacks. So credit to them for holding uh, their own. And then Stafford, obviously um, not taking any sacks and getting rid of it. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see. I, I'm not like down on this team by any means. I obviously that was a huge win back-to-back wins against two very good football teams. One of them being on the road. Um, I would have just liked to see them maybe do something to, to hedge their bet, if you will, hedge less needs bet um, going down the stretch because it's, yeah, it's, it's a long season. still. you got two full months plus the week in January of just basically doing this, that everyone stays healthy and it didn't happen last week. I mean, two guys just went out again. So we shall see, we shall see anything else uh, you want to add now that the trade deadline's over 10 games left guys, 10 games still left to be played uh, before the playoffs start is I mean, we're at week nine. I feel, I feel like we should be like halfway through. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not. Yeah. So you're right. I know. I mean, great. I love it. It's 10 games. It's still a lot of football to talk about and watch. So that's exciting. Oh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, a lot to get through. So, but hey, huge win back to four and four. Um, it's great. Aren't technically the Cardinals leading the division right now? Yeah. Yeah. With a, with a, with a blowout of whichever team they played. <laughs> yeah. The Bears. The Bears, Bears have been yeah. a very weird team this year. Like they look good some weeks and just awful other weeks. Um, which I well, know and, and and the Cardinals added uh Baron Browning from your hometown Broncos team. Yeah, they sure did. Um, who's a lot of talent. He is uh injured, but they got him for like a sixth round pick. So again, that just shows I think the Rams could have gotten someone like that for for pretty cheap just to add some some assurance on either side of the ball. But you know. We won't harp on it anymore. The deadline's over. Um, you know, it's What's time. Done, uh, done. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we can look forward to that. But hey, I, very much alive sitting at, you know, the whole NFC West is going to be wild down the stretch. Arizona at five and four, Rams four and four, Niners four and four, and Seahawks four and five. Um, it is going to be an intense, um, intense uh, down the street, down these final 10 games. Let me ask you this real quick. Cause this is, this, I think is fascinating. Obviously these numbers don't mean a lot. Cause you get blown out one game and throws it. But what do you think the Rams net points are meaning points for versus points against? I, I just saw it. And I want to say it's like negative six, negative 24. Oh, dang. <laughs> well, the, every game has been close except for that, except for the blowout against Arizona, which was a, what, like a 24 point. That was, was probably that a 24 the point win. Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. So you have Arizona is actually who's winning the division. They have a negative seven net points. The Niners who are in third have a positive 28 net points. Seahawks negative 11 and last and the Rams at negative 24. Um, so, you know, that just doesn't not a, I don't think that's a very hugely credible stat just because obviously one or two games can change that a ton, but what would you guess is the how do I phrase this? The the most negative points, most negative net points in the NFL. I got I got a point towards the the Panthers on that one. I'm gonna say under 80. Uh well done. You're right on the Panthers. Negative 146. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Who just beat the Saints, who was only negative 22. Um, it's such a weird year. I mean, I, I legitimately think for the first time in probable probably five years or so any team can win 
any 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 good team, any playoff team can can win the the Super Bowl this year. Yeah. I I totally agree. I mean, it's so bizarre. I mean, the Saints were remember the Saints and the Cowboys were both two and zero to start the year, and everyone's like, and the Seahawks. Yeah, the Seahawks. I was like, wow, these are three of the best. Like the Saints were blowing people out, or maybe the Saints blew out the Cowboys. Half the Cowboys were one and zero. Yeah, yeah, the Saints were two and zero. Like they looked dominant again. It was back to the the glory days of the offense, and they haven't won since. They've lost seven straight. (laughs) Fired their coach. (laughs) Fired their coach. Crazy. So uh, in Rams land, it's much better than that. But anyway. Anything else to add, or are we good to? Have we recorded since the Dodgers won the World Series? I was gonna, I don't know if we have actually. I don't think we have. Go Dodgers! Yeah. Go Dodgers! Big, big, uh, yeah, World Champs, Los Angeles Dodgers. We cover them now at lafbnetwork.com. So make sure to follow all of our Dodgers content. But Lakers are after a good start. Lakers, uh, yeah, Clippers had a 26 point come from behind win last night. First win at Into a Dome. They were 0 4, so finally got that home win on that two billion dollar stadium. Um, How's the, how are the Kings doing? Kings are off to a pretty good start. Good. Right on. Yeah. Love, love me some Kings hockey. So um, I just love hockey. So we'll get, we'll get hockey coverage here very soon. Once we have the, once we have the bodies, the manpower. Um, so, yeah. So thank you all for uh, tuning in. This is the Rams skinny here in the LAFB network. If you have not already subscribed to our YouTube channel at Rams LAFB, please hit that like and subscribe. It helps us out. You can find all of our content at LAFBnetwork.com, including editorial and social content. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, just search Rams skinny and you can subscribe to us there for skinny T. I'm Ryan Derrick. Thank you as always, Ramley, for hanging out. We'll be back here in a couple days uh, to preview this Dolphins game coming up, which is be before the season started, looked like it was going to be an electric game. The Dolphins have been a very odd team, obviously, partially due to missing Tua Tunga Vailoa for most of the year, but he is back. So that offense looks like it will be getting back on track. So we'll have a lot to talk about heading into that game. Everyone be well, be safe. Go out and vote. Talk to you all very soon.